Gordon Strong joins me this week to discuss lager fermentation and judging beer. This is Beersmith Podcast number 291. This is Beersmith Podcast number 291, and it's late October 2023. Gordon Strong joins me this week to discuss lager fermentation and judging beer. Thank you to this week's sponsors, Craft Beer and Brewing Magazine. They invite you to join their upcoming brewery workshop, March 24th to 27th in Austin, Texas. This one-of-a-kind event brings together professional brewers to help you start or grow your own craft brewery. To learn more, please visit breweryworkshop.com. Again, that's breweryworkshop.com. And also the American Homebrewers Association. This year's Learn to Homebrew Day is going to be a smash. Join their celebration on November 4th by brewing a single malt, single hop beer with a new brewer. To learn more about this year's celebration or join the American Homebrewers Association and get a free brewing book, please visit homebrewersassociation.org slash experimental. Again, the link is homebrewersassociation.org slash experimental. And I'm pleased to announce that I'm now celebrating 20 years of Beersmith Brewing Software. I launched version 1.0 of Beersmith way back in late fall of 20, 2003, so this is my 20th year in business. I'm planning an anniversary party next spring to celebrate the 20th year, so stay tuned for more information. And finally, a reminder to click on the like or subscribe button on YouTube, iTunes, Spotify, or whatever platform you're listening on. Clicking those buttons is a great way to support the show. And now let's jump into this week's episode. Today on the show, I welcome back Gordon Strong. Gordon is the President Emeritus and Highest Level Beer Judge at the Beer Judge Certification Program, as well as author of the books, Modern Homebrew Recipes and Brewing Better Beer. Uh, Gordon, it's a pleasure to have you back on the show. How are you doing today? Hey, Brad. Great to see you again. I'm doing great. <laughs> so uh, let's see. It's been over a year since I had you on last, believe it or not. Uh, what have you been up to uh, in the brewing world lately? Oh geez, I've been uh, I've been traveling around. I just got back from Fargo, North Dakota. Um, went up and talked to them about uh, some of the topics we're going to talk about. Cool. Were you out um, uh, doing a professional a brewery or something group. else? Go ahead. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. With a with a local uh, local brewery uh, here in the Dayton area, um, brewed a. Uh, Kind of a Mexican dark lager, something, um, something for Christmas time. So a little bit stronger, a little bit richer. So hopefully that'll turn out. It's in the fermenter right now. Nice. And um, I don't know. A month or two ago, um, I was in South Africa, um, giving a giving a talk there and uh, doing a little sightseeing. That's pretty cool. Uh, and I think you had GABF too, right? Yeah, yeah, I uh, I judged GABF finals this year, and um, yeah, I slipped in a little uh, a little trip down to Brazil to do a competition down there in between uh, South Africa and GABF. So yeah, I've been uh, I've been keeping busy, moving around. <laughs> nice. Um, well, today you want to talk about lagers and specifically the fermentation character of lagers. Um, let's start with talking a little bit about what makes lager fermentation flavors, you know, distinct and different from ale fermentation. Most of us, of course, the majority of homebrewers make ales. Yeah, that's true. Um, uh, you know, lager, lager yeast is a different strain. Um, well, they have different strains of lager yeast, but lager, lager yeast is actually different, uh, yeast, uh, species. Um, but uh, you know, you hear about the differences being in top fermented, bottom fermented, but really, um, I find the flavor profile is quite a bit different. Um, ales tend to be uh, more estery and lagers tend to be more sulfury. But um, the, the parts that I want to talk about with fermentation profile actually covers both esters and, and, and sulfur. But yeah. A higher a higher sulfur content is um, sort of expected in lager yeast, but it is awfully uh, strain dependent as well. 
Yeah, I mean, sulfur is one of the issues I always run into when I'm when I'm making lagers, um, especially during fermentation. You get a lot of a lot of sulfur typically coming off the fermenter. Um, at least when I brew them, they tend to fade over time. But um, but you know, why is sulfur so common uh, in lager fermentation when you really even sense it uh, in ales? Yeah, it's just uh, it's just part of what lager use produce. Um, it's um, it's it's normal. It's um, it's I've, I've been doing some research into um, food chemistry and um, um, other food products where sulfury kind of smells. I mean, sulfur is a very very broad category. So, you know, if we just say just sulfur, that's that's a little too encompassing. The sort of the pleasant sulfur aromas, um, you know, you'll find those in, uh, you know, many wines. Uh, you know, Sauvignon Blanc wouldn't seem the same if it didn't have um, the sulfur level and, and, and other food products. Um, a lot of tropical fruit actually have a little bit of a sulfur uh, note in them as well to add complexity. So. Um, sulfur is one of those things that, um, uh, it's good in some situations and oftentimes it's, uh, uh, pretty bad. And sometimes it's the specific compound and sometimes it's just a matter of the, the, the concentration of it. So, you know, anything to excess is, um, likely to, uh, come off bad on the palate and, and, you know, sulfur's. Um, you know, not any different in that regard. Is there anything in particular you can do about sulfur if you have a, you know, a big sulfury smell coming off your fermenter? Well, I mean, you're not drinking it while it's fermenting. So the biggest thing is uh, let it finish. I mean, if it's, uh, if it's blowing off of the beer, um, um, you know, that's, you know, it's volatile and it's uh, leaving. So, um, you know, open the windows or something, let it go. <laughs> um, um, actually, the sulfur evolving during fermentation, that's actually kind of a good thing because um, then, you know, it's not necessarily retained in the beer. Um, if if you have a higher sulfur level in the beer than you really want, um, I would say um, a couple things. You can let it lager. Uh, because the sulfur tends to reduce um, over a, a, a you know a long lagering time, you know a proper lager, something close to freezing for um, you know several weeks, maybe months. Um, you know, just give it some time; it'll 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 settle down. But I also I also have a technique that I've sometimes used with excessively sulfury. Um, beers usually if i if i'm trying a new strain and i don't like how much sulfur it produces because usually i'll i'll i use a few strains that, that are known not to produce a whole lot um, but if i do wind up in some of the beer you can it is volatile and you can get rid of it so usually i've got it in a, a keg at this point because it's done uh lagering and it's really just kind of conditioning if you over carbonate it um, cold and then let it warm up and like let the you know pop the uh, the pop it um, um, fast and you know it'll be like fermenting again it'll be um, since you're warming up something that's carbonated all that gas is going to want to go and it'll tend to scrub out the volatile sulfur in the beer as it's escaping um, um, sometimes I have to do that uh, a couple of times so you you know let the um you know let the gas get out of it and uh um hit it up with the co2 again and chill it back down and repeat the process so i mean you're but actually you usually using, using co2 to scrub it out huh that's pretty cool i've never tried that yeah 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 i th I think i wrote about that i think i wrote about that in modern homebrew recipes um you know something about in the in the section on loggers. I think I wrote about like how to fix a sulfury logger. But you, you know you're getting you get rid of some other volatiles as well. But sulfur is kind of more volatile than most. So um, 
you know, try that. But usually, usually I try to avoid getting into that situation. So, you know, having, uh, having a healthy fermentation, using strains that are known to be low sulfur producing, and then having a, um, you know, a proper amount of time for lagering. I, th- I find the people that try to rush lagering usually um, produce, uh, you know, less satisfactory beers. They lack the, the sort of the smooth um, uh, palate uh, that, that I expect in the lager. Um, well, we started uh, our discussion, at least via email here, that, with the, the term clean fermentation. And you were saying that um, a lot of judges had trouble with, uh, you know, determining what a clean fermentation means, particularly when we, with respect to lagers. Uh, and the term's often thrown mm-hmm. around a lot. Is, is clean fermentation really kind of an absolute term, or is it really sort of relative to the style we're targeting or the, the beer that we're making? Yeah, that's that, that's a good observation, um, um, and and this was kind of the, the the basis of the talk I was giving in Fargo because it was to judges um, that at at one level there are there are some absolutes when you're talking clean, and that's when you know the the things that are always faults in any style of beer. So at some level, um, clean fermentation just means. Um, free of technical faults. So it's that technical fault area where it's somewhat style dependent. So some styles allow for a wider range of yeast byproducts um, than others. So yes, to me, clean fermentation is kind of like balance. It's it when you're using it in a judge context, it really should be relative to the style. Mm-hmm. There is some level of absolute, but that only tells part of the story. Because um, the way that judges misinterpret that is if they see a um, the description of a, a clean fermentation, the mistake is to um, assume that means neutral and, you know, there's nothing there at all. And yeah, I mean that's that's kind of easier to detect as you're a judge, but think about what it's like to drink something like that. I mean, you're you're basically telling somebody to produce an intentionally bland product, and you know we make jokes about um, you know commercial industrial lagers being somewhat bland, but if you read some of the things I put in the style guidelines and say like, well, for American lagers or international pale lagers, for instance the yeast profile is often the primary differentiator between different brands of beer. So you can't say, yeah, this makes a big difference, probably the biggest difference in identifying and and differentiating beer, and then say, and it should all be absent because brands do taste different. So I think, you know, I think perhaps we need to work on the, what a clean fermentation really is in the context of lagers. So uh, let's take it, take it and, and actually apply it to lagers. Uh, what does clean fermentation really mean for a lager? Um, particularly if it's a long, you know, a beer that's relatively young or fresh. Yeah. Um, so I, I think, I think Germans understand this a lot better than Americans, probably because they're exposed you know, it's more of a lager culture, and they um, they have better, fresh examples. So um, this is something I hear from Europeans, and you know, I, I accept it as well, that American judges tend to reject very fresh-tasting lagers that have a... Germans will see that as a marker of freshness. So I'm, I'm not talking about, like, bad sulfur smells you know it shouldn't be like rotten eggs or sewer gas or you know various body odors but um there is a a a fresh yeast sulfur note that is present in um um lagers and it's actually kind of desirable because it knows you know wow i got a, a nice fresh example um you know, when Americans 
are, are dealing with a German beer that's been bottled and then exported. You know, we're going to get that fleeting sulfur when you open the bottle. It's like, oh, I smelled some sulfur and now it's gone, which as a sideline is, is actually the sort of the phenomenon that I'm, I'm talking about and how you fix the lager that you brewed is, you know, you're letting it, you're letting it gas out like that. But, um, you know, back to the point, you know, we're not getting the lagers fresh enough. So, um, for the German examples, but if you go try them over there, yeah, it's going to be different. So, um, to tie in the sort of GABF angle, one of the places I like to go um, in Denver, especially with people that haven't been out there before, is um, you know, take them to Bierstadt because um, they're like a, a lager, German lager specialist. And they're like the slow pour pills they have is just amazing. And, and that <laughs> has that fresh. Yeah. <laughs> I think yeah, I've been you're, you're, there. You're I've been at, there. Yeah, it was it was fantastic. <laughs> you're, you're smiling at the record. I can tell you've been there because of the way you smiled. Yeah, <laughs> it's a it's a happy memory. Um, they do a good job in a lot of the styles, but the the slow pour pills in in particular gets that. You know, I want to say it's it it's got like an eggy quality to it, but it's it, in no way it's a rotten egg. It's it's almost. It's almost like a very like a hard boiled egg the minute you peel it. It's it, it's got a little bit of that fresh egg note to it, um, but it doesn't come off as spoiled. So um, I think American judges would benefit from sort of understanding that um, if you're telling people to remove that, you're basically telling them to take their fresh lager and let it get old before you serve it. And, um, you know, I tend to think that um, fresh beer tastes better, and uh, you probably get a lot of other flavors there as well. So um, um, judges shouldn't, like, automatically reject that. But, yeah, if it smells like rotten eggs or if it smells like sewer gas, yeah, totally run the other direction. But a little bit of sulfur in the finish of a... Uh, you know, in the, especially aroma is really, is really, you know, a lively, fresh, inviting, um, you know, it, it tells you get ready to have a, a good beer. And you see these in, you know, Keller beers tend to play this up because they're, they're trying to be fresher as well. Um, when you get the good example, it just, it, it, it's hard to talk about it this way because you're saying something that is sometimes a fault is acceptable, which means you have to also think about how much is too much and say, you know, it's enough to be pleasant, but it's not so much that it's objectionable. <laughs> yeah. I mean, w one of the things I notice is all beers have flaws in them, right? It's just, it's just, what's the threshold of that flaw? And is it something that actually detracts from the beer, right? Yeah, I think, um, um, one of the things they did at GABF um, was I was I was kicking this idea around in my head, and I talked to some other people I was judging with while we we're waiting for beers to show up. And I, I was talking to uh, Tommy Arthur of Lost Abbey and Pizza Port, um, you know, a, you know, a legend in in the craft beer industry. And I said, you know, I think I think we're sort of understating lager fermentation character. And he goes, Oh yeah, if 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 it didn't have those things, it would be really boring and we wouldn't want to drink them. So, um, you know, it was, it was, it was good to get that kind of validation that the, the notion I was pursuing was, you know, something that, um, people sort of instinctively understand, but remember when we're dealing with beer judges and style guidelines, not everybody's going to have like, GABF final level judge chops and people have to learn sometimes. So, you know, how do we use this vocabulary to describe the beer um, with understanding that maybe people haven't actually tried them before? So it works great when you have like the, you know, it's shorthand for experienced judges, but not everybody, not everybody is there yet, you know. I was the new guy once, and uh, you know, I know what it, I know what it was like to uh, 
not be able to understand what styles some styles were. Um, so um, it's a it's a fine balance to walk when you're when you're trying to describe beers this way. So this is part of the effort is I'm you know just trying to raise awareness and get people thinking about it that you know some amount of sulfur is is okay in a lager and also some amount of esters is okay in a lager. That's the other thing that some people think think is somewhat controversial. Hmm. Um, do you want to talk about esters at all uh, in lagers, perhaps? We didn't really cover it. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. So uh, I'll, I'll, I'll tie in this, like, South Africa trip. So um, good hosts there. They, they, set up, uh, they set up some events for... Uh, um, speakers to go on trips and things while we were there. And, you know, something that I thought was not that uh, interesting was they're saying, well, you know, would you like to go tour the, uh, the Heineken plant? Like, well, I've seen a lot of breweries and, you know, it's, you know, a big lager and, you know, there's not going to be a range of things, but, you know, they promised we'd be doing some other things after. So yeah, fine. I'll go. And, you know, we wound up actually having a tour. Um, so people who were beer people and, and we had, we were given a tour by three brewers, you know, there were no public relations people and, you know, people that understood what they were making and could answer technical questions and hadn't been told not to. So we actually had some really good discussions. And, and one thing I learned about um, how Heineken is made is like many um craft breweries they're doing high gravity brewing so they're brewing a stronger beer and then they're diluting it because it's you know more cost effective that way you know and that can produce more esters in the beer but also <clears throat> i was looking at the, the the orientation of the fermenters you know you can envision these tall cylinder conical fermenters that you see and big breweries are going to have enormous ones you know they almost look like you're in a missile silo or something um, and I'm like, why is this one on its side? You know, it, it was, it was, you know, laying in the, you know, it looked like a submarine, right? It's this, you know, you just see this long tube. And it's like, well, it, Heineken goes into that fermenter for the first four days of fermentation. And if you think about um, the fermenter geometry, it has a lot more surface area. It's, 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 it's enclosed. It's not open. but um, you know, for people that do deep sea and that kind of stuff, think about, you know, the pressure from the column of liquid. So the, the pressure on the yeast is lower during that. So it's actually encouraging ester development. And they say that's exactly what they're doing. And it's, it's, it's full, they, they, they have a target profile that they're looking for in their beer and they're manipulating their, their fermentation regime to achieve it. So after four days there, they pump it into a traditional um, uh, fermenter to finish off. So they they let us sample the ingredients and the beer at several stages as we went. So it was amazing to see, um, you know, how how the beer changed. But the but the real kicker was we got to try the beer from a conditioning tank basically at the last stage before they released it for packaging. So it was finished, it was good to go, and it was it was quite literally the freshest beer I've ever had in my life. Um, it was it was so delicious. And you know, Heineken's a decent brand. Um, I, I I you know Sometimes your choices are limited, and, and that's a good one to call for. Um, and, um, you know, so I'm familiar with its profile, but I never had it taste that good. And it had a little bit of that sulfur, you know, and it also was a little, uh, it was a little estery, and it was delicious. And, um, you know, they're running all sorts of analysis on this. They have a target profile they're trying to reach, and the breweries, all the different Heineken breweries competing against each other. It all gets sent back to the mothership, and they're rated. And this was, you know, like the third best Heineken brewery in the world, or something. They they claimed they're very, very proud of it um, at, at how well they met the profile 
um, of the beer that people are expecting. So, uh, you know, this is a long way around of saying, you know, here people are intentionally, they're, they're manipulating the process to try to get esters into the, the beer. And um, as judges, we shouldn't like then say, well, this is somehow flawed. Um, when this is, you know, it's something that's listed as a classic example for an international pale lager as it should be. And, um, you know, it's there and it's in a lot of other profiles as well. Interesting. I talked to, I talked to a friend who, um, you know, works in Anheuser-Busch and, and they do something very similar in, in, in tracking the profile, tracking all the components and understanding what contributes to, um, you know, basically they see it as the brand, the, 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 the sensory profile of the finished beer. And they're like, oh, yeah, there's, 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 you know, several different esters that are in there. That's really cool. Um, well, before we leave loggers behind, I wanted to discuss, uh, uh, do you have any fermentation <clears throat> advice for homebrewers that are looking to make nice, clean, uh, fresh tasting loggers? Yeah. Um, so it starts with uh, um, the the yeast selection. Um, you know, get something that you're familiar with. I mean, I, I think lager yeast is something where um, it has its own rhythm, and you have to get used to it. So don't be don't be changing it around. You know, hated the results, but unless you have um, you know, unless you have something specific you're trying to do, you can do a whole lot worse than one of the 3470 derived strains, including the dry yeast. I mean, I've, I've used the I've used that as a dry yeast, and people, oh, you know, in several countries that don't have liquid yeast uh, use it reliably. It's a real workhorse. It works great. Um, you can use the liquid yeast as well, but um, that does a good job. Um, but Whichever you choose, um, try to find a strain that that's not producing a whole lot of excess sulfur, because then that'll just, well, you know, cause problems down the line for you, unless for some reason you want that profile. So, I mean, I also like um, the uh, White Labs uh, German Bach yeast that, you know, it's how to make your beer taste like anger, um, which is a good thing. Um, and you know the Mexican lager strains are kind of cool too. Um, they uh, do a similar good job, but all the all the yeast have you know they'll they'll produce subtly different uh, profiles. So find one that's pleasant to you, and then you know get to use it. So um, don't try to do these gimmicky um, lager things. I hear people talking about like oh you know. If you if you just have a high pressure fermentation, you can ferment it as warm as you want, and you'll be done in like a fraction of the time. Yeah, um, you might limit ester production that way, but um, what about everything else? Um, you know, there's more to the sensory profile of beer than esters. So understand um, all the different complex range of chemicals that are being produced. You know, just because you can't put a name on them doesn't mean they're not there in the finished profile. So if you're trying to manipulate one variable, you might be unwittingly um, changing, you know, a dozen others, not to the better. You know, I, I, I look at it like uh, fermenting a Hefeweizen. You know, I, I tend to ferment those on the cold side because I think it gives a cleaner finish and you know, the, the, the cleaner uh, fermentation profile. Um, that doesn't mean there isn't banana and clove in it. It just means there's banana and clove and not a lot of other stuff. So when you crank up the fermentation temperature, you get more of that other stuff, which kind of makes it taste dirty. And I think I think lagers sort of go the same thing. So, you know, I try to keep it, um, you know, around 50-ish. Um, and, um, you know, and I, I think that works well. It might take, you know, it might take a, you know, a little longer, but. Um, you know, if you're using the using the dry yeast, um, you know, it's easy enough to put in more. And it, um, I, I think it's a little easier than than dealing with all the, the sort of the starter things you have to go through. Because usually you ought to pitch more lager yeast if you're, you know, going cold. 
don't if you do use liquid yeast, don't shock it. Don't uh, don't have a warm starter and dump it into a cold uh, beer because that'll that'll cause the yeast to sort of get stunned, and then they'll have to get readjusted to the environment. You wanna you wanna pitch into something that's the same temperature or something that's slightly warmer. Um, um you know just to have a good fermenting environment have the the nutrients and the condition that yeast will want and then give it time. you know let it finish and then remember lager isn't just the, the the fermentation lager is actually you know the the name is really derived from the process of 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 letting it mellow out over time in cold conditions you know, you don't have to have a cave if you have a, you know, you know a nice uh, fridge. If it's if it's good enough for your milk, it's good enough for your lager. You know, it's not going to go bad. But I, you know, I try to keep it as close to as close to freezing as possible. Um, you know, the old German rule of thumb was give it uh, one week of lagering for every degree Play-Doh, and that winds up being sort of quite a long lagering. But you know, I try to give it at least Give it at least a month um, um, for a normal beer, a uh, normal strength beer, and you know you could go you could go more than that um, for for uh, bigger beers. Um, if you're choosing the strains wisely, you know a lot of people talk about uh, you know the need to do diacetyl rests. I personally don't do them because I, I don't find that my beer throws diacetyl. So um, you know. Do it if you if 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 you think there's diacetyl in your beer, then fine, you can do it. But if not, it, it's not really adding anything. All you're all you're doing, and if you do a diacetyl rest, by the way, is you're you're warming it up, which lets the yeast metabolize some of its byproducts. It will it will continue to break down um, um, some of the things that it produces. You know, I just call that cleaning up after itself. Mm -hmm. But if you run a, a nice, healthy fermentation, yeast can sort of do that normally. Um, some professional brewers will croisen and they'll, they'll they'll pitch in some freshly fermenting yeast at the end to sort of speed up that process. You know, there's nothing wrong with that. That's that's kind of traditional. But um, you know, I I you know I plan ahead for a lager and I take my time and you know I I like how they turn out. Um, you know, I've had some good uh, good results with them. So, mm -hmm. take your time, enjoy the results, and uh, uh, you know, save me a bottle. I'll try it. <laughs> um, well, Gordon, you were recently a judge at both uh, the World Beer Cup and the Great American Beer Fest. Um, what were some of the lessons learned from this year's lineup of beers? Well, um, you know, you see the uh, you know the the things that people enter tend to be the things. That that you find when you walk in doors. So, you know, you can get um, um, so many different IPAs uh, in, in various different uh, configurations. You, you tend to get a lot of these um, barrel and sour beers and beers with a lot of extra ingredients in them. So, um, you know, the lesson I see is that, um, you know, there there's a, uh, there, there's room for me, people to make beer flavored beer, um, you know, enter a category that, you know, doesn't have 400 other entries in it. And, you know, maybe you, you'd stand a better chance of meddling and maybe you'd stand a better chance of me staying in your tap room if you don't have like nothing but IPAs. So, yeah. um, I, I'm, I'm, I'm drawn to variety and, um, I'm seeing less and less of it. That's a, that's a problem I, uh, on my end as well. I, I, you know, you used to even, even the grocery store, you used to be able to get a variety of beers at the grocery store. And now it's almost all IPAs or American lagers, basically, you know? Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, as, as somebody that started uh, home brewing in the nineties, I mean, at the, the, the time then it was, um, you know, we're homebrewers because, you know, there's all these great beers of the world and we can't get them. So you have to make them. And then, you know, that changed, you know, the, you know, craft 
brewing took off and you could get these and people were importing stuff and it was great. And then we see the pendulum seems to have swung and, you know, people decided beer means hazy IPA and that's all you can find. It's like, well, good thing I know how to make beer because I have to do it again, you know, <laughs> and for exactly the same, exactly the same reason. It's the, you know, everybody's making the same thing and hazy is just sort of becoming generic. And, you know, I don't mind them. I mean, I've had, you know, every year I go to the, when I'm actually at GABF, the festival, not the the judging, um, you know, I, I go to Weldworks and try uh, Juicy Bits because I I tend to think that's probably the, the best commercial example there is. And I try it and I'm like, yeah, this is, this is great. I have no problem with this beer. If I'm, you know, I had some friends from uh, Brazil who were here for World Beer Cup, and I said, oh, people serve hazy IPAs in Brazil, but I bet you never had one like this. So taste this, remember this, and when you judge them, be thinking of this, because this is a great reference. And, you know, that's the way I look at it. It's, it's, it's fun, it's interesting, but, I, you know, I've had it. So, um, you know, I, I like trying a variety of beers, so I'm always looking for um, something interesting and you know to me something interesting is what's probably boring to other people <laughs> but i love a good lager and, and and one trend that i do see is a lot more people brewing um interesting lagers um there are um you know i saw a trend towards mexican lagers a couple of years ago and and now i see more and more people doing you know they'll either call it a rice lager or a japanese rice lager you know, something with a lot of adjuncts in it, but super clean, very dry, um, you know, and delicious if they if they make it well. Well, that was another people question. People that are making... Uh, go ahead. Yeah, I'm go sorry. ahead. Oh, I was just going to ask, you know, what other trends have you observed in craft beer brewing? Obviously, um, lagers is certainly a big one. Yeah, yeah, that's... That, that, that was kind of segueing to that. The, go ahead, uh, I'm sorry. Um, yeah, no problem. There's... Um, you know, I see while, you know, some people are known for their IPAs, I mean, we're seeing more and more what I would call lager specialists, people that, you know, have a, an interesting range of lagers, particularly if you go to their, their pubs, not necessarily what you find in the market. Um, and I think that's interesting because if somebody can make one kind of lager good, chances are they make others um, good. When I was in, when I was in, uh, uh, World Beer Cup, we were judging it sort of north of Denver. It was an early round, and uh, there's a brewery in Boulder called Upslope. And, um, you know, we stopped there one day, and um, I was I was really impressed with the range of lagers they had. I went there because I had tried their Italian Pilsner. It was really good, and I wanted to um, taste it on draft. And they had a Japanese lager and a... a German Pilsner, several different Czech beers. They had a whole, you know, you know, half the half the beers there were lagers, and you know that was that was that was pretty interesting. I, um, I quite enjoyed that, and you know, those are the kind of beers where you could you were where you could try several. You know, you your your palate isn't blasted out immediately. So, um, lagers and um, people are doing you know, applying sort of these hoppy techniques to lagers more. So the the rise of the so-called West Coast Pilsner, which is basically um, just, <clears throat> you know, bumping up the late hops and dry hopping a Pilsner like, you know, like you make a West Coast IPA. Um, similar hops, sort of American hops, often the the sort of, um, not always my favorite varieties because then they get into the garlicky, oniony hops. Um, West Coast pilsners made like West Coast IPAs with a uh, garlicky, oniony hops, um, and that actually, you know, the Italian pilsners were first. They were dry hopped with noble hops. So um, I see that as a broader range of hoppy pilsners. Seem to be a, a trending item. Um, actually, I, I hadn't seen it in um, 
the GABF, but I did see in Brazil they have a they have a style they just call hop lager. I mean, if you think about like an American lager, just with a lot of light hops, so it's not it's not nearly bitter enough to even call it a pilsner. You know, it's just a simple beer, but it actually has a lot of interest in the the hop dimension. So um, I haven't seen that here because. Um, maybe breweries think between IPAs and Pilsners, everybody wants bitter beer. So, um, you know, if, but that kind of leaves people too with fruity sours and lactose beers as the only alternative. And I think I think there is I think there is another choice for people. So that's that's a trend that I, I saw in Brazil, but not in the uh, not here. Um, cold IPA is another sort of trending beer. And, um, you know, that has um, some of these other kind of features that you'd see in um, some of these other styles, like the Mexican lager and the um, rice lager. You know, it, it generally an adjunct IPA with a lager yeast that's, you know, they're fermenting it warmer because it's like traditionally an ale style. So it's okay for them to drive a higher ester profile. And and since we were talking about sulfur earlier, the higher fermentation temperature tends to um, help drive off more of that, that sulfur that the yeast produce. You know, whereas like the India Pale lagers were more produced like an IPA just with lager yeast and those tended to have sulfur clashes because a lot of these American hops, especially the ones that have garlic, onion, chive kind of characters, that's a lot of, that's a lot of sulfur. And then you add sulfur from the yeast and they wound up being sulfur bombs. So, um, you know, some, some thought with the choice of hops, I think, uh, works, but you know, cold IPAs usually are at a warmer, warmer fermentation temperature, which um, explicitly is being done to control um, the, the sulfur profile. So if you take the trend in lagers where people are, are, are making these sort of hoppy pilsners, something that's sort of clean, including the, the Japanese and Mexican ones where they have an adjunct quality, and now you have uh, cold IPAs, which are like, um, you know, I think it's uh, I think it's a rebuttal to the hazies in that they're 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 going for the original stripped down essence of being able to show the hops and, and you know have a clean dry finish, um, you know, with a little adjunct quality. Um, so I, I I think the trend there is what I call the return to drinkability. So you know. Not everything is, you know, a heavy, sweet pastry stout. Not everything is a fruity, lactose, sour thing. Not everything is a thick. Those, you know, could be sort of difficult beers. Um, you know, they might be impressive if you just take a sip at a time. But if you're talking about something you want to have three or four glasses of, you know, I don't think so. It, it, you know, you have to kind of be be prepared for that um so return to drinkability is a, a positive trend that i pull out of all this thing i see and i i'm interested to see where where that gets applied next um well gordon uh, i want to close you you have uh, you did some work recently i think a presentation describing how pro pro brewers can best enter a competition and really best uh you know set their their best foot forward i guess when they're representing their beer um, could you highlight a couple points out of that, perhaps? Um, yeah, that was that was uh, that was the talk I gave when I was in South Africa. I gave one to judges and one to um, brewers, and uh, you know, it was kind of tackling the same problem from from both you know from the opposite side of if you're a brewer, try to think like a judge. Um, try to try to understand how the evaluation works and make your beer easy to evaluate. So enter it in the right place, read the guidelines, pay, don't pay attention to what you thought you wanted to brew, taste 
taste the profile of the beer and see how well it matches the guidelines you're using. There, um, there are other guidelines out there, particularly for commercial competition. So understand the version you're using and read it carefully. See what required information is there so you provide it to the judges because you're really passing along information that are um, that are going to help them evaluate your beer. Judges, um, judges want really do want to pick the best beer from the group that's in front of them. You just have to understand that judges don't always have the best beers in front of them because sometimes judging goes through multiple rounds, and sometimes the best beer happens to have been in a previous round's dump bucket. So you know you're doing your best to pick the beers that are presented to you. That's what judges do. So what brewers should do is try to assist that process. Um, give, give the judges useful information that are relevant to the style. If the, if the guidelines ask for very specific information, go ahead and give it. Don't be, don't be cute about it. Don't tell like long stories. Don't use marketing terms. Use, use words that would be useful to the judge that would help them recognize what it is that you're trying to do. Because particularly if you're doing a specialty kind of beer, sometimes the judges just are curious about what your original concept was. Um, and if you can sort of state that in a short uh, form, then judges would say, oh, okay, I get it. I see what you're trying to do. And yeah, that kind of works. Uh, judges want to like your beer, so um, don't be difficult with them. Um, cause Judges are under extreme time pressure, and if you have to make them work harder for your beer, you know they're they're likely just to just say, "Okay, this was good, but I like other ones better." So try to make the judge's job easier because, really, I mean, we 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 have to get through them in less than ten minutes of beer, um, and you know we're doing this all day long. So um, there's there's a very little, you know, there's a very short window to um, get a judge's attention and impress them. So, um, you know, that's the, that's the best advice I have, is try to make the judge's job easier, present it in the right place, give them all the information they need, help them out. And this works for home brewers as well. Um, same, same deal. If you're, you know, make sure which version of the guidelines you're using is, is correct. Uh, you know, read all of it, provide all required information and enter it in the place that it actually tastes like. Because um, that's that's how judges, I mean, judges don't have your recipe. They don't know anything about you. don't have this information. Just it's what's in front of them. So try to make that job easier, and, and you're likely to do better. Um, well, Gordon, I know you wanted to cover the upcoming cider guidelines, but we're actually running low on time <clears throat> here. So um, so I want to get your closing thoughts on lagers, craft beers, and judging, and, and perhaps we can cover cider in a, in a future episode. Yeah, yeah, the, the cider guidelines are, are almost done. Um, and there's, there's quite a bit to talk about there. There's a lot of changes. So, yeah, that, that might be a topic for a, 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 a bigger episode. So, um, Lagers, um, lagers are delicious. Um, if you if you make lagers, I will come visit you. Uh, um, there, they are. They are, you know, a well made lager is worth a trip. Um, and if you're if you're making them in a range of uh, traditional styles, so much the better. So um, I'm I'm happy to see the growth in lager specialists and people that really do a good job of it. Um, if you're a judge, uh, try to be a little bit more open-minded on the ester profile and the amount of sulfur in it. Fermentation is, is asking a judge to, or a brewer to produce something that's boring because lagers shouldn't be boring. So look for the look for the interesting flavors. See how the different beers, um, you know, accept that there is – a range to lagers. You might have your favorites, but um, other people are making different things, and that's okay. They're, they're, they're still in the same style, and allow, allow the brewers to be creative. So I, I ask judges to not think of um, sort of these background esters 
as as flaws, I think of them as flavor interest. And don't look at sulfur as a flaw. Think of the pleasant yeasty sulfur as as just you're getting a very fresh beer. So if you put those together, you know, maybe you'll find some um in, you know, they're they're not the kind of flavors that are going to hit you over the head like an IPA, but you know, accept uh, the subtlety and nuance that you get out of a well-made lager. If you're brewing the lagers, um, yeah, uh, find find favorite strains that work for you. Keep it cold. Um, don't rush the lagering process. Um, get sort of smooth out. Um, and uh, yeah. The best is uh, just remember to save me a bottle because if I if I find that you made a lager, I'm going to ask to try that. If you give me a range of beers that you have available, that's probably one of the first ones I'll have first. So um, um, you'll get my attention by by that. And um, and I think a lot of a lot of the the, the pro brewers. You know, if you if you stop by and see what they're doing or uh, catch up with them on their off time, they're they're drinking a lot more lagers than they are IPAs. So, you know, think of it as like the professionals drink. Um, you know, there is there is an interest in lagers, and I think it's um, um, I'm, I'm happy to see I'm happy to see more of them available. Well, thank you, Gordon. I uh, really appreciate you coming on the show today. Yeah, it's always great to catch up. Uh, you know, I, I, I see you out at events sometime, and we we catch up. But uh, I know you have a I know you have a big audience because I hear uh, I hear so many people um, through the year when I'm when I'm doing things. You know, talking to me about um, um, you know when I was on your show and we had this discussion and they learned something. So I know I know you're doing good work out there, and I um, and I know. When I travel to other countries, they appreciate that, um, you know, you have the you have the support for uh, other languages uh, as well in in your in your product, and uh, um, people really are people really are listening to this information. So it's um, it's a it's a great way for uh, for us to support each other. It it helps get the message out to the the same group of great people out there. Well, thanks, Gordon. Uh, today, my guest is Gordon Strong, author of the books Modern Homebrew Recipes and Brewing Better Beer. Uh, Gordon, once again, thank you for coming on the show. It's always my pleasure. Thanks, Brad. A big thank you to Gordon Strong for joining me this week. Thanks also to this week's sponsors, Craft Beer and Brewing Magazine. They invite you to join their upcoming brewery workshop March 24th to 27th in Austin, Texas. This one-of-a-kind event brings together professional brewers to help you start or grow your own craft brewery. To learn more, please visit breweryworkshop.com. Again, that's breweryworkshop.com. And also the American Homebrewers Association. This year's Learn to Homebrew Day is going to be a smash. Join the celebration November 4th by brewing a single malt, single hop beer with a new brewer. To learn more about this year's celebration, or to join the American Homebrewers Association and get a free brewing book, please visit homebrewersassociation.org slash experimental. Again, that link is homebrewersassociation.org slash experimental. And I'm pleased to announce that I'm now celebrating 20 years of Beersmith Brewing Software. I launched version 1.0 of Beersmith way back in late fall of 2003. So this is my 20th year in business. I'm planning an anniversary party next spring to celebrate. So stay tuned for more information. And finally, a reminder to click on that like and subscribe button on YouTube, iTunes, Spotify, or whatever platform you're on. Clicking those buttons is a great way to support the show. I'd like to thank you for listening, and I hope you have a great brewing week. Mm-hmm.